All right, hey, what's up, y'all? So today what I'd like to do is recap the goals that we have for this low-carb phase of the progression. And to get there, I want to do a brief review of all the different little mini concepts that we've learned to bring us up to this point. Because remember, this is a progression-based progression. We're easing ourselves into these more difficult phases. If we'd have started out saying, hey, I want you to do something that looks low carb right out the gate, I think most people would have had a really hard time with it. But because most of us have already built up a lot of metabolic flexibility, then I think this is gonna be something very easy to experiment with, if you're ready for it. So, starting out, remember our first meeting was all about making this really solid argument for our definition of real food. And remember, when we talked about real food, what is the purpose of real food? To us, the purpose of real food, the reason that we're eating food in the first place is to give the body the nutrients that it needs to build the body and to contribute to all the different uh, functions inside the body. And we're also acknowledging that when we eat food, we're getting energy from food, but we want to get energy from food in the right way. And we want to train the body how to make energy the right way, which means that we need to have some strategies around our carbohydrates because Remember we talked about how the body can get energy from both fat and sugar. Um, and so since sugar is the opposite of fat for fuel, we just have this basic simple rule of measuring out our carbs to three quarters of a cup max of safe starches and three quarters of a cup max of fruit per day. And if we can do that, then we're minimizing that carbohydrate signal. We're forcing the body to learn how to use fat for fuel and we're kind of accomplishing that other purpose, okay? So that first meeting was all about learning about our definition of real food, figuring out those basic rules, and then also learning how to read labels and understanding that from this point forward for the rest of our lives, we always wanna read labels and always ask questions. We wanna avoid the obvious things like processed food, wheat, corn, and soy, and the industrial seed oils like corn, canola, soybean, vegetable, safflower, rice bran, sunflower oil. And if we're choosing things made with good ingredients, we're minimizing the toxic load on our body and that's gonna be better for health over the long term, all right? So we, we go out and we implement those basic goals. Oh, and then uh, another thing that we learned at that first meeting was the importance of space in between meals. Because remember, body fat is stored energy for when we're not eating. Therefore, we need to go through periods of not eating <laughs> to teach the body how to use its own body fat for fuel. So this little bait and switch of minimizing the carbohydrate signal, embracing space in between meals, choosing things made with good ingredients and minimizing the toxic load, for a lot of us, just that piece of it is gonna uh, give us some dramatic changes. We're gonna feel better, we're gonna have better energy levels, we're gonna have better mood, um, and we're also, most of us are gonna see some health markers and some body composition changes, even though that's relatively uh, a very short period of time. Now, the second meeting, uh, we talked about mainly being a real foodie and understanding that although we have all these different options that we can turn to, that are made with better ingredients and that are less toxic, they're probably not serving our long-term goals, especially if they're carbohydrate based. So like the Siete chips and tortillas, um, the cakes and cookies and crackers and ice creams, it's better to be choosing things made with good ingredients um, when we choose those things, but we only wanna to turn to those things on special occasions and very rarely, because again, they're probably not serving our long-term goals of health and body composition changes. So we wanna focus our efforts on being a real foodie and eating the most of our nutrients from 100% fresh real food. That's where the magic happens. That's where we really start to feel really good and start to see a lot of different changes. Um, at that meeting, we also talked about our keys to metabolic flexibility. Um, we talked about how maybe if you're ready for it, you can experiment with moving towards two meals per day. Skipping breakfast is the easiest thing for most of us to do. Um, we also talked about maybe experimenting with timing your carbohydrates later in the day. But if you're measuring out your carbs to a max of three quarters of a cup of each per day, um, whether you space that out throughout the day or not, I don't think it matters as much as just making sure that you're measuring those things out. Um, but that was the experiments that we walked away from that second meeting with. Now the third meeting, this meeting that we just had was all about low carb. Now to get to our definition of low carb, we talked about insulin resistance. And we talked about how the majority of us are overcoming and undoing years, if not decades of insulin resistance. And insulin resistance is the driving force behind 
all the symptoms of metabolic syndrome and chronic degenerative disease and really insulin resistance is the thing that's keeping us from obtaining the optimal health that we want and the optimal body composition that we want. So remember, you know, insulin, it's a necessary hormone. It has a lot of different functions inside the body. When it comes to food though, insulin is responsible for telling the body to use energy and nutrients and telling the body to store energy and nutrients. So in the presence of insulin, we are in this mode of using and storing energy. So in the presence of insulin, it's impossible for us to burn body fat and be metabolically flexible. All right, so every time we eat, we secrete some insulin. Different macros have different impacts on insulin. So no matter what your meal consists of, you're secreting insulin, but carbohydrates are gonna have that biggest signal with insulin. And so then we talked about the three main things that are the contributing factors to insulin resistance. The first one is the type of foods. And for most people that are not in our realm, it's refined carbohydrates and toxic fats and oils. The reason toxic fats and oils contribute to insulin resistance and the reason that we harp so much on the importance of reading labels and asking questions is because when your body, when you consume these toxic fats and oils, your body builds itself with these toxic fats and oils. It builds its cell membranes with them. And that inhibits your body's ability to actually use the appropriate fats for fuel. And it inhibits your body's ability to use its own body fat for fuel. All right, so crucial that you avoid those toxic fats and oils. But anyway, one of the things that contributes to insulin resistance is refined carbohydrates and toxic fats and oils, or one of the things that keeps us from undoing the insulin resistance that we already have is just consuming too many carbohydrates in general, even in the real food realm. The second thing that contributes to insulin resistance is the frequency of meals. So if carbohydrates give us the biggest secretion of insulin, every time we eat, we secrete insulin no matter what the food is. So it also has to do with frequency, right? So if I'm eating every two or three hours, you know, uh, five, six, seven, eight meals in a day, then I'm having way more frequency of secretion of insulin than if I'm eating two or three meals in a day with no snacking. All right, so this is why it's so important not to snack, depending on the number of meals that you choose, but then also it's important to embrace this idea of not eating all the time and moving towards two meals a day, I think is, is the sweet spot for most people. So then it naturally follows that we wanna experiment with low carb. Now, before we got into low carb, we asked ourselves like, how low carb is the SHC? Like the SHC, if we're measuring out our carbohydrates at three quarters of a cup of each per evening or per day, we're still relatively low carb. That's still usually within that 50 to 60 to 75 grams of net carbs in a day. And that's still really low carb. Most Americans eating the standard American diet are eating 200 to 300 grams of carbohydrates in a day. And so the SHT is already lower carb. Um, and, and the only reason that we like to put that information out there is because we want you to understand that even though you're having your starches and fruit, because it comes from real food sources, it just does something different inside the body, okay? Um, but we do wanna go through a low carb experiment. Now our version of low carb, the rules are basically pulling out the dominant sources of starch and sugar, which means pulling out the safe starches and pulling out the fruits, all right? We're not getting too caught up and neurotic about reading labels and avoiding every single thing that has a little bit of sugar. Our main role is avoiding dominant sources of starch and sugar while still making this work in a modern lifestyle. Okay, so we're not weighing and measuring anything beyond our little rules around carbohydrates. You know, we can eat as much meat and fat and vegetables as we want to or need to. And the purpose of us doing a low carb experiment is to see how it makes us feel, to see how we look, feel, and perform. Okay. Um, the goal for a couple of weeks or whenever you do this on your own, because some people aren't ready for it, the goal when you do our version of a low carb experiment is to specify your period of time that you're tinkering with it. And then during that period of time, you're trying to get as many days as possible of our version of, of low carb as possible for the purposes of seeing how you look, feel, and perform, okay? Most people are gonna respond really well to it. Um, after a day or two, you're gonna, you're gonna notice that it's mainly mental and emotional um, as you're trying to fight, you know, most of us, you know, we're timing our carbs later in the day. So the difficult spot is usually the evening meal or the dessert around the evening meal. So if you can make it to bed on a day that your goal was to be low carb, then you've had a successful low carb day. And then you just want to try it again the next day and try it again the next day. And again, the goal is to get as many as you can in this period of time so that you can see how it makes you feel. And again, most people are going to notice their body composition change. They're going to feel better after they get through those first couple of days of, um, 
some transitional difficulties, all right? Um, and, you know, if you're not ready for it, then it's not something that you're obligated to do. Maybe you just learn about it right now and then you have it in your back pocket for something to experiment with in the future because if you're still focused on just trying to choose things made with good ingredients or if you're still focused on just trying to be a real foodie, then I would stay there and not add too much complication to what you're doing because what you're doing is already really good and, um, and beneficial for you, okay? Um, some questions that have come up since then, we kind of already addressed our... Uh, definition of low carb is pulling out dominant sources of starch and sugar so you don't have to read labels and avoid everything that has sugar if you have a salad dressing that has balsamic vinegar it's totally fine if you have some ketchup that has some sugar in it that's totally fine because you're not eating a bowl of ketchup right you're using it as a condiment or a complement to a real food way of eating um, I would say even having a little bit of honey with your tea in the evening is totally fine um, we're just trying to eliminate the dominant sources of starch and sugar okay um, what was another thing that came up? Oh, what was the other thing that came up? All right, I found my notes. Here's the other FAQs around low carb, all right? So um, what if you're already thin? Like, do I have to or do I need to do something like this? Or am I at risk of damaging something because I'm already lean? So remember, um, when we're trying to nurture metabolic flexibility and metabolic efficiency, Body composition changes are like a side effect, all right? They're not the primary focus or the goal. And there's plenty of people out there that are metabolically deranged, that have type 2 diabetes, um, insulin resistance, that exhibit like a normal body composition or a normal body weight. And that doesn't mean that internally they don't have a lot of things going on. So what we're trying to do with metabolic flexibility and efficiency is it is do this for health because it's better for the body over the long term if you have body fat to lose that normally means for most people it equates to losing that excess body fat um, if you don't have excess body fat to lose it's not about losing the body fat it's about becoming metabolically flexible okay um, the other question was condiments we've already addressed that yes absolutely like condiments are in play there's no need to read labels and nitpick anything that has sugar you know and throw it out it's like our main focus is removing the dominant sources of starch and sugar all right and then the other one was um <clears throat> do i have to do this if i'm not ready um you can make up your own version of low carb maybe your low carb is lower carb maybe your low carb is instead of three quarters of a cup you go to half a cup of safe starches and or fruits or maybe you're just removing the fruits and just doing starches or maybe you're just chipping away at one thing that you normally have most days and reducing it or minimizing it or eliminating it all right I think it's still very useful to learn these concepts so that you understand them, although they are in the workbook. Um, you can always use them in the future, and I think it's important to have in the back of our mind how important it is that we nurture metabolic flexibility, metabolic efficiency, and that insulin resistance is something that's behind the majority of the suffering that we experience from a physiological perspective, okay? All right, cool. I think that's about all I got. A good little review. Um, <clears throat> let me know if you guys have any questions, comments, feedback, or snide remarks. We'll talk to y'all later.